You guys are so kind. Um, some of you emailed me on Friday morning or Friday afternoon and said, did you see? They even put a poster of you in front of EHC. <laughs> I said, really? You know, I, I don't get out of my office at all. I mean, it, you know, I just come to campus and I say to Dr. Hall said, I'm here, I'm an obedient servant. And then I go into my office and then at five or 6 p.m. I, I go home to my other office at home and I just continue to translate. So I walked outside for the first time in a year looked at the school map to find EHC for my office. <laughs> and I said, wow, you guys are the best. And you really are. You really are. Uh, when the board asked why I'd be willing to serve in this role, I said, simple, it's for the students. It's for our people. And you are my crown and joy, as Paul says in First Thessalonians and you are my heart. And so what is presidency is just another way to serve you. It's just a way to encourage you, and that is my goal. And along that line, uh, what better way to encourage in light of the Legacy Standard Bible? And I know some of the translators are even here this morning. Thank you for your very, very hard service, your, your sacrificial service to the Lord. And in fact, some of you students were involved in the Legacy Standard Bible, and I, we haven't forgotten that. We're still thinking and planning and executing ways to honor you in that process, and many of you were involved in praying for us, and I know that too. And so at this moment today, all of our labors have come to fruition, because as you know, the Psalms, Proverbs, and New Testament has been printed, it's been published, it's been shipped, and this morning it is here at the Masters University. And after chapel, each of you will get one for free. This is a gift. This is a gift from grace to you to you. So it's grace to you to you. All right, and, and we just want to thank grace to you for that gift. We want to thank them not only for paying for that gift, because gifts don't come free, we know that, but even this morning there was a team of people up early going to grace to you, I believe, to pick up these Bibles in their own cars, staff members here, to bring them here for you so that you would have them. One per person, please, and don't forget to say thank you, but we want to encourage you, and this is just the best way to get that started. And along that line, you're saying, well, Chow, hurry up and finish the message so we can get the Bibles. Uh, that would be encouraging too, so I'll do my best. And along that lines, this message this morning is about encouragement. It's about encouragement. So shall we pray together? Our God and Father, we, we remember the words of that last song, how powerful they are. What does the soul that is guilty, that is eternally condemned, that knows deep within that there is a God and he is in heaven and he is holy? What does the soul do that knows his iniquity is so terrible that there is nothing that can be done from a human perspective than to die in eternal death and to be separated from ever from the benevolent presence of the almighty creator? and knows that that is the right thing to be done, and there is nothing humanly that can stop that. What does the soul do when that creator sends his son to intervene and to stop the wrath from eternally condemning that soul? Because the son on the cross bore that wrath for him. And his righteousness, that is the son's righteousness, now becomes the guilty souls. What does that soul say? That soul says, not just thank you, but I am yours forever. And you are my God. And there is no one I delight in more than you. Because without you, it would be over for me. And so, oh God, 
we stand before you, remembering the power of your grace that pierces through the darkness of sin, that pierces through the impossible situation we found ourselves in, the hopeless and helpless nature of our own iniquity and guilt. And we thank you for such powerful, powerful grace. Grace that comes from you alone and because of you alone and through you alone and thereby for you alone. And I pray this morning, O God, that as we remember grace and we remember its power and we remember its commitment, that it would instill courage into our soul, that it would encourage us mightily as it did for your Apostle Paul years and years ago. Be with us now. Be with these students here. Soften our hearts to be eager to remember your word and to love your wisdom and truth and to live it out and rely on you, the God of grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Encouragement. We all need it. It's always helpful. As I was praying what to teach in chapel this morning, I was praying for you. This was definitely impressed on my heart, and it's not just because of current circumstances at the school or even outside of the school, really in the normal, whatever that means, part of life and part of the semester of this year, of any year for a student at the Master's University, really around the world even, this moment of the school year calendar is hard. Some people call this Mustang March Madness. It's just a difficult part. You survived the fall semester, that's good. And then you had winter break and and maybe that was refreshing, but now you're in the uphill climb. Your assignments are starting to mount and you're tired. The exhaustion and sleepless nights for one reason or another are also starting to mount. And tensions in the dorms are starting to mount. And things get harder and harder and harder at this point in time and there's less breaks and you're saying, chow, you're supposed to encourage us, not bring up all the problems. And that's true. Sometimes encouragement backfires. In fact, this reminds me of a time when the Bible department was fighting for the truth, and it was a grueling time. It was a tough time. And I could tell amongst my fellow faculty members that we were exhausted. We were tired. And I said, guys, never surrender. Never surrender. I'm going to show you a video clip, and it's going to inspire us. We're never going to surrender. We're never going to back down. And so Jason Beals comes into my office, and I say, here's the YouTube clip, and I play it. And it's a video of Sean Connery. And he's standing there with a sword in his hand. He's saying, never surrender, never surrender. And I was like, that's it. And it was good for that second until he got shot (laughs) with a crossbow and fell down mortally wounded. And we were stunned. Beals and I are there stunned in silence. And I hit pause. (laughs) And he said, Abner, that didn't turn out so hot. And I said, yeah, yeah, I forgot that part. (laughs) From then on, whenever new challenges come, he comes in my office and says, never surrender. (laughs) This is why you don't use movies as illustrations. Sometimes encouragement can backfire. can. But even though my usage of that backfired, there is something compelling There is something compelling about final words. That's why the scene is so dramatic. That's why in the film it's so memorable because it's someone's last words. And this isn't just true in Hollywood. This is really true in reality. And let's talk about reality, which we can illustrate through something like church history. Church history. You remember William Tyndale? In fact, he is, in a sense, the father of every English Bible translation, including the Legacy Standard Bible. We owe him that. He was used by God for that. And he translates through the entire Bible, turns it in, it's released, and then he's executed. He's executed. And as they were tying him to the stake and tying a chain around his neck to strangle him, here's his final words. 
Lord, open the eyes of the king. That's what he prayed. Lord, open the eyes of the king. And God answered that prayer. That's why you have an English Bible in your hands. God used that prayer. Never forget, never forget, translation doesn't come free. Your Bible doesn't come free. People died to give you that. Never take it for granted. Final words are powerful words, and they can be immensely inspiring, compelling, and encouraging words. I think of one other example, and you have a gentleman named Thomas Hawks. February 1555, he and six others were condemned to die, and everyone is terrified. Everyone is terrified. And Thomas Hawks says, brothers, I'll go first. I'll go first. I'll be the first to die. And to show you that the fire can be endured, I will give you a sign before I die. So they tie him to the stake, they add fuel to the fire, and they ignite the blaze. And immediately, his vocal cords, his ability to speak is taken away. And it seemed like the fire had utterly consumed him. And at the last minute, everyone's watching He raises his hands to heaven, claps three times, and dies. And at that moment, the others knew that God was faithful, that they could go through the flame because they saw someone's last moments and they knew the grace of God was true. Last words. They are powerful, powerful words. On a biblical level, You have Stephen's last words. What does he pray? Lord, forgive, forgive. And those words in Acts are answered by God because he saved the Apostle Paul in the very next chapter. Stephen's final words, they had power. They had meaning. They had significance. Final words can be some of the most inspiring, some of the most compelling, some of the most invigorating, some of the most encouraging words. And what I'd like to do this morning is to take you to Paul's final words. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 22. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 22. And as you turn there, As you turn there, let me just give you some background about 2 Timothy. And really, the punchline of context is this, that these are, what we're about to read, are officially the last words of Paul's last words. They are the last words of Paul's last words. They are all deliberate. They are all profound. Paul knows that 2 Timothy, these are, this is his final letter. These are his last words. Historically, we know that is true. Historical situation, we understand he's in prison. We understand he is awaiting execution. We understand these realities. And in chapter 4, Paul makes it explicit that he himself knows that this is this moment. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. You say that at the end. You say that at the end. Paul knows this book is my final word. This is my last letter I will ever write. He knows the race is about to be done. What do you say in your final last words? Well, Paul knew exactly what to do. And that even just reiterates and reinforces that these are his final words. He capstones everything that he has written. You can hear in the book of 2 Timothy over and over allusions to everything that Paul has said before. For example, 2 Timothy chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Where have you heard that phraseology before? Romans. Why? Because Paul is drawing on Romans. He says, salvation is by grace. It is always by God's grace. Where have you heard that? Ephesians. He talks about being a vessel for God, which alludes back to 1 Corinthians 3. He talks about being poured out in 2 Timothy 4. That goes back to the second chapter of Philippians. He even says, I can do all things. At the end of 2 Timothy 4, which reminds us of Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul has 
drawn upon everything that he has written. And in some of those letters, particularly Philippians, is most memorable because Timothy was there with Paul when he was writing it. And Paul is telling Timothy, remember everything I told you. Remember everything I said to you. Remember the very nature of this Christ-centered, grace-filled ministry. This is the capstone book. He's pulling it all together. And that just reiterates this is the end. Because that's what you do at the end. You pull your life together. And so by historical background, this is the end By Paul's understanding, this is the end. By Paul's action, it is the end. And in fact, it is deliberately deep because it reaches into all of Paul's life, all that he has thought under the inspiration of the Spirit, all that he has written, and it pulls it all together. And there is a purpose to this, and we know that. 2 Timothy 2, what you heard from me through many faithful witnesses, these things entrust to faithful men who will be able to do the same. Paul says, Timothy, it's your turn. I've pulled together everything that I've ever thought, everything that ministry is about, everything that service to Christ is concerning. Here you go. Take this and pass it on to future generations. These are the final words. And so as Paul tells Timothy what not to do, to not be ashamed, and what to do, be strong in grace and remember the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 3, what he tells him to do, to be resilient to the end as times grow worse and worse. As he explains all this to him, the book moves and everything is his final words. And then you reach in 2 Timothy 4, the last words of the last words. And you know, based on everything that we have said, Everything is deliberate. There is no such thing as an accident. There is no such thing as random. There is no such thing as coincidence. And Paul chooses his last words very carefully. And they are filled with theology because everything in 2 Timothy by design has been filled with theology. So what do you say? What do you say? Last words before you die. Last words that make a difference. What do you say? Well, we're about to read it. 2 Timothy 4, 22. Here are Paul's last words. Grace be with you. Grace be with you. And you might say, that's it? That's it? No, no kind of rhetorical flourish? No kind of amazing statement. No, no kind of good theological kind of discussion. Just grace be with you. Remember, everything is deliberate. Everything is intentional. This is not by accident. And there is profundity here for encouragement. There is great power here for encouragement. And I'd like to show this this morning. And really, the text wants to teach us this morning of this in two ways two ways. And here's the first point. The first point would be the power for encouragement. And the second way is the proof of encouragement. The power of encouragement and the proof of encouragement. And my goal for you is that in your dark moments and in your times of struggle, whatever they may be, and you don't know what to pray for, and you're struggling to find the words, you only need one. Grace. You only need one. That's Paul's point. You only need one word to pray for to God. Find grace. And we need to know that. So with that in mind, let's talk about the power of encouragement or for encouragement. And that's found in the first word of these final words of Paul. Grace. The reason maybe we're not impressed with this last statement And we don't understand how fitting it is and how satisfying it is and how encouraging it is is because we use grace all the time. We use grace all the time. It's it's used frequently and, and it should be used, but we have grown familiar with it. We are saved by grace. We talk about doing things by God's grace. We even sign our names in his grace. But here's the question. Do we really know what it means? Do we really know what grace means? And, and sometimes we as Christians, we come up with weird definitions of this word. We have weird perceptions of this word. Sometimes we think it just means nice or that God is kind. 
And he is nice and he is kind, but is that what grace means? Sometimes we just think of grace as a gift. It's a free gift. And sometimes we make it an acronym. We say it's God's riches at Christ's expense. But here's the question. If you plug those definitions back into the text of Scripture, do those definitions work? Do they actually do the job? For example, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we are saved by grace. You're saved because God is nice? Look, I think I'm kind of nice, like quasi-nice some of the time. Do you think I save you because I'm nice? That's it? Just because there's a kindness that automatically you're forgiven of your sins? Do you really think that's true? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. How can you be justified, Romans 3, freely by God's grace and God's grace being a gift? It says that God's grace is a gift, the gift of grace. If grace means gift, then all you're saying is it's a gift of a free gift. Does that make any sense? God gave you a gift of a free gift. No, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's redundant. It, it, it's illogical. That cannot be what it means. In John 1, Jesus is full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of God's riches at Christ's expense and truth. Does that make a lot of sense to you? No, these definitions don't work. They don't work, and here's what we're starting to find out. We don't know what grace means. You keep using that word, but I don't think you know what it means. This is the problem. So what do we do to figure this out? Well, we we go back to how the New Testament thinks about it. We go back to how the New Testament thinks about it, and the New Testament shows us the background that it intends for grace. And it says the Hebrew word chesed, which is often translated as loving kindness, is the background to this world. And how do you know that? Well, because, for example, it says in Exodus that God is full of loving kindness and truth. And then John intentionally translates that as full of grace and truth. And so the New Testament is saying that whatever loving kindness means, that's what grace means. And whatever grace means, it's rooted in loving kindness. So that raises the question, okay, now we just got to figure out what loving kindness means. So what does loving kindness mean? And guess what scholars say? Well, we don't really know. Well, that's just not helpful. That takes us back to square one, or maybe square zero, or if you really want to be technical, it takes us back to square negative. But let's talk about loving kindness and let's do an investigation a little bit into loving kindness. And it doesn't mean love and it doesn't just have the notion of kindness. Loving kindness, if you look at it and trace it out through the Old Testament, has kind of two interlocking ideas. One is total commitment. Total commitment that results in two, unilateral action. Unilateral intervention to change a situation. This is about commitment and power. Commitment and power. And we can see this. We can see this. In fact, loving kindness operates in the most hopeless and helpless situations, particularly when we're talking about God's loving kindness, because then his commitment and his unilateral, by himself, autonomous, independent intervention is most clearly seen because we're not doing anything. And we can observe this in scriptural texts. For example, Psalm 136. Psalm 136, it repeatedly says over and over and over, his loving kindness endures forever. And it says this, the sun rises. The sun rises because his loving kindness endures forever. Do you really think that God just says, hey, son, I'm nice. Let me give you a present. Please rise. No. What is going on there? It is because God's omnipotent power over the entire universe is being exerted and he causes, from our perspective, the sun to rise and to set. Not because we're good, but because we're not, but because rather he has committed himself to that in covenant and he coerces this to happen because he is in control and he exerts his power unto that end. Same thing with the Exodus. Psalm 136 talks about that as well. That God frees his people because his loving kindness endures forever. He does not free people from Egypt because he's nice. He does not say to Pharaoh, hey, I'm a nice God. Can you just let him go? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, hey, Pharaoh, let me give you a present. Unless you think the ten plagues are a present. No. What does he do? He exerts ten plagues that decimate a nation to free his people. And his people can't do a thing, and they don't do a thing. Why? Because they're utterly helpless. 
This is all God. This is his omnipotent power. Grace and loving kindness is God's activity to intervene in a way that he alone can do to have effects that he alone can produce. That is the nature of grace and loving kindness. And this is reiterated in Psalm 107, one of my favorite examples. There's a guy, he's thirsty. He's in the wilderness. He's dying of dehydration. So you say, well, of course, God's going to perform a miracle and give him a drink. That would be true. That would be miraculous. But this is not what God does. You say, what does God do? It says this, he raises up an inhabited city for this man so that in effect the man will live happily ever after. He doesn't just give him a drink. He raises up a city for the guy so that the guy in the middle of nowhere now has a place to live, eat, drink, and sleep. You say, I didn't see that coming. Exactly. That's the point. Grace does far beyond what you could ever imagine because it's God. Because it's God. Grace is not just kindness. Grace is not just niceness. Grace is God's commitment that no matter who you are and what you've done, because he has expressed his loyalty to you, he will do whatever it takes to get the job done, to keep his promises. And if that requires his omnipotent might, he will make that happen because he is loyal to you. That's the nature of grace. This is all that God is to do all that he has committed to. That is the nature of grace. And that's what we see in the New Testament. That's what we see in the New Testament. Why are we saved by grace? Not because we're anything special. We're dead in Ephesians 2. We're utterly helpless and hopeless. And what does God do? He intervenes. He intervenes with a powerful intervention with his son and the cross and the resurrection and the transforming of our heart, he unilaterally does that so that we are saved. That's why in Romans 4 it says this, that it is by faith so that it will be by grace. You say, why why is that? Because what is faith? Faith is relying on God to do it all. Faith is just the amplification of grace. Faith is the human perception and expression of God's grace because God does it all. He does it by himself, through himself, for himself. And and faith is just the recognition and the belief and trust in that. Grace is everything and faith is the expression that we are nothing and God is everything. And so Paul is very consistent He says it's by grace. That's why in 2 Corinthians, Paul says about God that his grace is sufficient. You can't have sufficient gifts and you can't have sufficient niceness. What do you need when you have a thorn in the flesh? You need power. You need the power to endure. Not just any kind of power, divine intervention to strengthen you at your weakest moment. That's what grace does. And so grace for Paul and grace for the Bible is not niceness. It's not kindness. It is God's commitment in unilateral action, him acting alone to intervene, to affect something that he alone can produce. If you want to really wrap your mind around this simply, just think of the vowels of tulip. Just think of the vowels of tulip. You are probably familiar with the acronym The U of TULIP is unconditional election. That's the commitment. That's the commitment. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. If God has chosen, if God has elected, if God has concluded, if he has expressed his loyalty to you, you, that is what drives him. And what does he do in that? Well, the I of TULIP is irresistible grace. It even has the word in it. And what does irresistible grace mean? It means that God intervenes in such a way, in salvation particularly, that he overcomes everything that you are, all your sin, your heart, and transforms you so that you willingly come to him. There is no coercion in that regard because everything works compatibly as he is superintending everything and nothing can stop that grace. Nothing can hinder that grace. That is what we are talking about. It is the ultimate commitment and his omnipotent power at work to keep whatever promise he has made, whatever guarantee he has made, to to you. That is grace. That is grace. And Paul knows that. He's lived that. He's seen that. He's fought for that. That's why in 2 Corinthians, for example, he 
always talks about grace. He talks about grace about his visit. He talks about the gift that the Corinthians were supposed to give in 2 Corinthians 8. God loves a cheerful giver as a grace. He talks about grace in nearly every chapter. And then he culminates all of that in 2 Corinthians 12. My grace is sufficient with you, for you. Why does he say that over and over? Because a false teacher and a legalist can never understand grace. Never. Why? Because a false teacher and legalism always focuses on what we do, who we are, what we have, what we merit. But grace is the diametrical opposite of that. It is God does it, not because of us. God does it through himself and not through us. And God does it because he does for himself, for his own glory. We are not part of the equation. And it is the most mighty thing ever because God does it. Paul prays in 2 Timothy, grace to you. Paul prays in 2 Timothy, be strong in grace, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.1. You know, you can't be strong in niceness. You can't be strong in a gift. Never heard that before. You can't be strong even in God's riches at Christ's expense. But you can derive strength from the almighty God who unilaterally intervenes with the power that you see in creation, with the power that you see in salvation, that will get you home. Paul tells Timothy, it's not clever tricks that are going to get you through life and ministry. It's not human wisdom or schemes. What you need is nothing short of divine intervention. And guess what, Timothy? God guarantees it. It's called grace. It's called grace. And for this very reason, then, I think now you understand Paul having defended and declared and expounded upon grace. At the end of his life, what does he pray? Grace be with you. It's the most encouraging thing ever because this will get you through. And you might say, well, Abner, you just don't get it. I've sinned pretty bad, and I feel terrible. I feel rotten. How can I come to God? How, how can I ask for help? Remember the nature of grace. It is not dependent on you. You don't merit it. You don't earn it. It is because God committed to you. That's why you come to him. That's what makes grace so encouraging. That's why you can ask for it, because it's not because of you, but because of what God in his own being has committed to you. That's why you can ask for it. Friends, grace is encouraging. Some of you might say, but I, Dr. Chow, I just feel so tired. I'm exhausted. I just can't go on. It's just too hard. Really? Are you sure that grace is going to help? Remember the nature of God's grace. This is its speciality. When people are helpless, when you were dead in trespasses and sins, God intervened and affected the most glorious outcome. Of course grace is sufficient. Of course grace is enough. It is what it does. It is operating always in the most helpless situations. Ask for grace. It works. And, and some of you might say, but the situation is just overwhelming. There's just so many complications. I can't see a way out. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. And if there is a light, it's a train and it's about to hit me and I'm going to die. Just remember what grace does. It takes a desert, makes it an inhabited city. It takes a sinner condemned to die, makes him a saint and a son. It takes one who is harmed and broken and ultimately glorifies him. Grace does far beyond what you ask or think by definition. That's what makes it divine grace. It is God's signature move. What you need is not just self-help or therapy or drugs or whatever you may think will help you. What you need is grace. This is what God does. This is who he is. Pray for grace. And when you are feeling overwhelmed and it's like the darkness is surrounding you and you can't think what to pray, one word, brothers and sisters, one word. It's all you need. It's grace. Because it is the power of encouragement. It is divine power for encouragement. That's what grace is. And you might say, well, that sounds nice. 
sure, good, nice word study. But can you really convince me? Well, I don't have to. Paul will. Paul will. You see, because it's not just that there's power in this phrase for encouragement. There's a proof that it really does encourage. There's a proof that it really does encourage. And look at the last words with me. Grace be with you. And let's focus on the last word, you. You say, you? Really? Are you sure? It's just you. What's the big deal? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And to understand how big of a deal it is, you have to go to the beginning of Paul's ministry, the very beginning. And what you have to understand is this, and it's so crucial, that for Paul, what has always been ingrained in his heart, his soul, his mind is this. It is the universal church. It is the saints of all time everywhere that has always been ingrained on his heart. Acts 9, road to Damascus, vision from heaven comes down, and Paul sees the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees him in connection with Daniel chapter 7, that vision of the Son of Man. And in Daniel 7, in that vision, Daniel himself sees that there is one like the Son of Man, and he shares his rewards with the saints. He shares his reward with the saints. They are connected. But here's what becomes interesting as Paul is seeing the glory of Christ, and he recognizes that it is the same glory found in Daniel chapter 7. Christ says these words, why are you persecuting me? Now, if Paul, Saul at the time, was pretty snarky, which you should not be when you are confronted with Christ, but if he was, he might say, well, technically... I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting the church. But what is Jesus' point? The church is who? Me. We are connected, just like the Son of Man is connected with the saints. In fact, what does Paul often call us as believers? He calls us the saints. Why? Because now we can put it all together. Because Paul saw what Daniel saw on the Damascus Road. He saw what Daniel saw, and he recognized that you and I and the church are part of the host of saints mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. We are part of that group by extension. And so his knowledge now and his eyes are opened now to realize that his whole life is dedicated to that eternal group of people. So yes, Paul does write to local churches. Absolutely. He does support the local church. Absolutely. But his heart and his efforts are for the church universal. That's why he takes three missionary journeys, and he goes to the Gentiles, because this is about the church universal. He, in the first missionary journey, breaks through to the Gentiles. In the second one, he goes deep into the Gentiles. And third, he strengthens the mission so that it can continue to and on for perpetuity. It's not just in his actions, it's in his writings. It's in his writings. That's why in Colossians, he talks about in his letters, make sure this is read by other churches because he recognizes he's not just writing to Colossae, he is writing to the universal church and others must hear it. That's why in Ephesians, Christ dies not just for a local church, he dies for the church. That would be really awkward if Paul only had in mind the local church. Which, which local church did Christ die for? Awkward. But that is not what is going on. What Christ died for is his bride, the whole people, those saints that Paul saw on the road to Damascus. That's why in 2 Timothy 3.16, the word of God is profitable for all. For all. There is this notion in Paul's actions and in his writings. Yes, he loves the local church. Do not get me wrong. But he has always had a heartbeat for the global, universal church of all time. This was ingrained in the road to Damascus. This was ingrained in his activity. This is ingrained in his writings all the way to the end. Look at 2 Timothy 4 with me. Look at it with me. Do you see in verse 10, it mentions these places, places like Thessalonica, and place, those places are along the pipeline. They're along the pipeline to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. They're the pipeline to the, to the Gentiles and to every region in this world. And Paul is telling Timothy, you go to those people because the gospel must go on. The gospel must go on. And at this moment, you realize Paul's not just thinking about Timothy. He's not just thinking about Timothy, and he's not even just thinking about the people that he mentioned in verse 10. He's thinking about the church everywhere, 
everywhere, all over the place. That is what he is concerned about. That is who he is contemplating. Likewise, in verse 19 at the end, notice he talks about all these different people, and they're all located in and around Rome. Why is he talking about these people all of a sudden? You're about to die. Well, what's going on? It's because those are the people Timothy needed to partner with to get the job done. And with that, Paul's not just thinking about his present situation. He's setting everything up for the future. And at this moment, you realize Paul is thinking about not just himself, not just Timothy, not just the local church. He is thinking about the universal church and everywhere for all time. That is what his heart is for at this moment. That is what he is laboring. Everything in his life has come to this moment so that he has set up to launch the church everywhere for all time. And you say, why does this matter that he's thinking about everyone everywhere for all time? Because throughout 2 Timothy, throughout 2 Timothy, every single time Paul has said you, he has been using it in the singular, and it is about Timothy. It is about Timothy. You, Timothy, be strong. I'm praying for you. You, Timothy, you, Timothy, you, Timothy, you, Timothy. In fact, even, even in 2 Timothy 4.22a, the Lord be with your spirit, singular, Timothy. But for the first time, in his last words, he changes. And he does not say you, singular. He says, you all. Grace be with you all. And here's the question, who is Paul praying for? Who is Paul praying for at this moment? And you know the answer. We know the answer. He is praying for those who have been on his heart from the very moment of the road to Damascus, impressed by the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ, those he has labored for in his missionary journeys and in his writings and even in the last minutes and moments of this last and final letter that he has orchestrated and implemented so that it would be executed across the world. He is thinking about the saints in every place for all time. That is who he is on his knees for at this moment. Brothers and sisters, realize this. Who was Paul praying for here? Every single saint. And at this moment, you realize this. He was praying for you. And he was praying for me. That we would have the grace of God in our lives. And to be sure, this is a reminder for us that we need grace Paul knows that. That's why he's desperately praying that for us. And that is our encouragement. But don't just stop there. Don't miss this. What is he doing here? He is not just saying grace matters. He is showing you the power of grace. Why? Because in your darkest hour, in Paul's most dire moment, in the moment of death, where you would expect him to be on his knees, cowering in fear and ashamed and afraid and praying for himself, being a little bit selfish, at this moment, he is not. He is praying for who? For you and for me. And he is showing us at this moment, the grace of God is sufficient. The grace of God is enough. Why? Because it can produce someone who is faithful to the end, no matter what the circumstances are. Remember the apostle in jail on his knees. Grace is enough. Grace is enough. And with that, Masters University, brothers and sisters, it is your turn. Paul prayed these words to hand this epistle, which capstones his ministry, to Timothy, who handed it down to faithful men, who handed it from generation to generation to generation. And brothers and sisters, now it is your turn. This is your time to step forward and to take this. Paul prayed for you. This is your moment before God and his plan. And there will be challenges. And there will be moments that are dark for all kinds of reasons. You've even begun to experience them. Know this. Pray for grace. 
it'll get you through. It'll get you home. Because grace isn't just God being nice. Grace is God taking all his power and using it on your behalf. That'll get you home. And if you don't remember that, or if you're afraid of that, or if you're uncertain of that, remember the apostle on his knees in prison. Grace made him faithful to the end. That even in the most dire moment, he didn't remember himself. He was consumed with Christ, and he was brave and courageous and selfless and godly and faithful no matter what. Does grace work? You better believe it. Remember the apostle on his knees. Masters University, it is your turn. It is your time. Grace be with you. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, your grace drives all things. It is not because of our might or our wisdom or our ability. It is because of your grace. You intervene. You drive things forward because of your promises and your commitments and who you are, independent of us. You drive it all forward. May we understand the immensity and the enormity and the effectiveness of your grace. And I pray for these dear believers here. Lord, if they have no other word to pray to you, may they come before the throne of grace and find grace in their time of need. May that always be the case. And we know it is the case because you, O God, are the God of grace and have committed that in and of yourself to us unconditionally. Not because we are worthy, but because you are God. Encourage these saints. Strengthen them by your grace so that we are all faithful to you in the end. In your name we pray. Amen.